Well, we've been friends uh, for a long time. And uh, when uh, your church came up and on our independent Baptist church placement list, uh, Josh and I had, uh, or Pastor Lena and I, had already been talking. And he told me that he felt that God wanted him to uh, be a pastor. And uh, so I prayed with him about it and encouraged him. And uh, so then I called him, and when your church came up on the list, and I said, you know, by, you know, of course, the Holy Spirit speaking to hearts and things, and I called him and said, maybe you ought to look into this one. And he did. And so uh, that was very interesting that the Lord had spoke to me about it and then spoke to him about it. So, amen, right? Yes, we're thankful for that. Well, how many of you were in last night's service? All right, good group. Then. That's wonderful. And Kim and I looked around Mount Vernon today and drove a <laughs> half hour. No, <laughs> I like that, you know. Uh, we had, well, you know, uh, we always try to, you know, kind of look at the community when we're, in a place and see what might be peculiar or might be uh, interesting or things like that. And so, um, you know, uh, we enjoyed driving around and we was driving around looking at a lot of different things today. So we're thankful for the opportunity. If you have your Bible, you can turn with me to Galatians chapter 5. I kind of want to piggyback on what we did last night a little bit. And... I know that we're talking about family here, and you know one of the things that uh, we deal with all the time are our families. Uh, you know, with the, you know either the mom and dad you know struggling, or the children struggling, or all of them struggling, and uh, we have the opportunity to deal with hundreds and hundreds of people, and we are thankful for that opportunity, and we're thankful when we see a family uh, that is heading to tragedy or is already in tragedy be able to change uh, their life and change their home for the honor and glory of God. Now, we talked about last night the issue of, okay, what do I, you know, being in fellowship with God. And I again want to tell you that I think that uh, most Christians today do not give near enough, uh, you know, near enough thought to that subject. And because of that, uh, you know, they think that they're spiritual because of what they do, you know, uh, but not what they be. And the, the, the real deal here is, is that you've got to be to do. And most people have that backwards. And so I want to read tonight from Galatians chapter 5 and verse 16. And it says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are the con contrary to one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I've also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. And if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let's begin by having a word of prayer. A kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for the opportunity to share your word with the group of people here this evening. We pray for those that are ill, that you'll lift them up, help them to get better. I pray tonight, Lord, that 
I pray that uh, you'll fill me with your spirit. And Lord, that I uh, pray, God, if there's somebody here tonight who's uh, not saved, that they may come to know thee as saved. And if there's a person here out of fellowship tonight, that they will have their fellowship restored. I pray that right now that you'll use me, help me, and make my mind be your mind. Open your word here to us this evening. Help me now. I need your help. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, now, walking in the Spirit. You know, Romans 8 is the Holy Spirit chapter in the Bible. And you know, the Apostle Paul in Romans 7, he's talking about the fact that, you know what? You know, all the things that I should do, I don't. The things that I don't do, I should. And, you know, and he gives us, you know, how, you know, how in the world am I going to do this? And the whole chapter is talking about, you know, the flesh versus the spirit and that kind of thing. And he comes down to Romans chapter 7 and verse 24 and 25, and he says, who's going to deliver me from the body of this death? And he says, I thank God that Jesus Christ my Lord. And... You know, and you read that, and you get down to the end of that chapter, and you say, okay, I got that, but the question is, how? Get it? Most people read that, and they, and they think, okay, yeah, that's me, you know. I'm struggling with this, and I'm struggling with that, and I'm struggling with something else, but how? Well, he doesn't tell you in chapter 7 how, but he starts in chapter 8, and he makes it very plain that it is the Holy Spirit and his power that is going to make a difference in your life. And it's a wonderful read, okay? And we'll get to it here uh, probably Sunday, okay? But it's a great, it's, it, it, it really puts the whole thing in perspective for us. And, but here, <clears throat> last night, I was talking about the people that we deal with that are out of fellowship with God, about 75% of them, they've lost hope, they're losing hope, about 75% of them are out of fellowship with God. The other 25% aren't saved. Now, they've been members of independent Baptist churches, you know, and, but they're not really saved. They've never truly been born again. Now, and I'm, I'm not going to cover that part of it right now because I'm working on the fact of the people that are out of fellowship with God. Now, <clears throat> if I'm out of fellowship with God, I'm fully capable of doing everything in this list. Fully capable of it. Now, this is an ugly list. And it says, the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Okay? And he says here, now I'm going I'm to read the list for you. If you look with me at uh, verse uh, 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest. And by the way, the works of the flesh are really being manifested in church families today. I'm not surprised anymore about anything I hear. Now, the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness. Now, that's the word for pornography. Lasciviousness means unbridled lusts. Idolatry, witchcraft. Witchcraft is an interesting word. The word behind that is the word pharma, which means pharmacology, which means drugs. Okay? Hatred, variance, that means arguing. Emulations is an interesting word because it means jealousies, but it's ambition to equal or excel others. That's a work of the flesh. Okay? Murders, drunken, and by the way, and it, or it says, uh, excuse me, wrath. Strife. Wrath is anger with a strong desire to avenge. Strife, seditions, heresies, envyings. Envyings is an interesting word because do you know that the Bible says that envy is worse than anger? 
The definition of envy biblically is wanting to, to possess and destroy something that you're not supposed to have. Get it? Possess and destroy something that you're not supposed to have. Now, so envyings. So that is a work of the flesh. Envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings. That's a really bad word. It's people who are immoral in multiple, with multiple people at the same time. Okay? And such like. Somebody says, I haven't done all of those. Well, such like, gotcha. Okay? And such like. Now, it says here, as I've also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, let me put it to you like this. If you can consistently do these things and the Holy Spirit doesn't convict you about it, you've never been saved. Hear me? If you can consistently do these things and the Holy Spirit does not convict you about it, you've never been saved. Now, but think about it all the different things that are in this list are fully capable to be done by a Christian who's out of fellowship with God. So I better understand immediately that I really do need to take some attention to my fellowship with God every day. And last night I told you about the four questions that we have the counsel he's asked. Okay? And the reason why is because we really know that if they're not in fellowship with God, we can't help them. You understand? So if they're really born again, they're going to have to understand that they've got to be in fellowship with God. And most of the time, this list is in their life somewhere. Some of the things in it. Now, but I want you to look at verse... Uh, 15 with me for a second, okay? It's kind of interesting here that this starts off this way. It says, but if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed one of another. Now guess what? I said last night, and I will reiterate it again, the church of Jesus Christ today is almost paralyzed by the gossip, the backbiting, the critical spirit, and everything that goes on with it. But then again, I want you to understand, the people that backbite, the people who gossip, the people who have the critical spirit, guess what? They're out of fellowship with God. And they don't even realize it. Now, you know, I have the opportunity for many people to contact me, and, 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 and they'll say, uh, did you hear about? And, you know, by the way, that just throws my antenna straight up in the air. And you know what I say? <laughs> That's a good one, yes. You know, I, I say, have you ever talked to him or her? Well, you know, I mean, there, this was a guy who told me, and he's a good man, and I know it's the truth. No, you don't. You're just passing along something you heard. And that tells me that you're not in fellowship with God. Uh-oh. I want you to understand now notice, notice the next verse here. Watch carefully this. I want you to see, because this affects our church, it affects our family, it affects our children, it affects our marriage. Notice what it says. Verse 16. This I say then, walk in the what, folks? Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. 
So the only way I'm not going to fulfill the lust of the flesh is to be a spirit-controlled person. I've got to walk in the spirit. It's the only way. There is no other option in the room. I had to be a spirit-controlled person. Now, it says in verse 17, For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that ye would. In essence, I'm not going to be the Christian that God wants me to be because... I am focused on not walking in the Spirit and because it means I have to take some consideration to where I'm at in my life and it's easier for me just to, you know, let my mind run off to the junkyard because everything starts in the mind. Now, I want, you, I want you to look now at down at ver verse 22, and it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. Now, I want you to look at verse, four, uh, verse 24. Just think about this verse for a minute. It says, and they that are Christ's, so if you're saved, have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. So the flesh is all about our emotions. You know affections? The flesh is all about our emotions. But you notice that word lusts? Bill, did you notice it was plural? That means more than one, doesn't it? Now, when we get somebody up having a real, intimate, personal, and passionate relationship with God, about 90% of the problems go away but it's the other 10%. Now, every Christian, there's at least 82 different lusts in the Bible that a Christian can have. Now, and Ephesians 2.3 talks about demand lusts or desires of the mind. Think of an alcoholic. Okay? Okay? So, we have what we call as a chain sheet. We have all 82 lusts listed. And it's in the back of the booklet upstairs, What Should I Do If I'm Doubting My Salvation? And it's also in the back of the, book, the booklet, How to Deal with Worry, Anxiety, and Fear. So if you want to test yourself. Okay? On a scale of 0 to 10. 0, 1, you know... Here's the lust listed, zero, one, two, three, not a problem in my life. Four, five, six, it's getting to be a problem. Seven, eight, nine, and ten, it's a demand lust, controlling behavior. Most Christians have at least three demand lusts. So think about it like this, and I tell our accountants, okay, I'm putting my hands up in the air. On the right-hand side, you come into the doctor and you tell him your head hurts. And you've been running a fever and your stomach's hurting. Okay? Now, those are symptoms. That's not really what's going on. That's not what causes it over here. So many times people think that they are, I don't know exactly what's wrong with me. I mean, you know, I'm doing this and this and this and I feel this and this and this, all those are our symptoms of what's really going on over here, the demand lust that's controlling behavior. Ephesians 2.3 says it's a desire of the mind. 
So when a person has a demand lust, controlling behavior, and when we talk about demand lust, most people think we're talking about moral. That's only one of the 82. And so it controls behavior. And the reason, the reason it's controlling behavior and that person's life is because of the fact that, first of all, they, if you look at the word lust or lusts in the Bible, it's there a lot. It's there, <laughs> lack of better words, Pastor, buku times. Okay? It is there... And, and, you know, and it's in 22 different books of the Bible. So, and it's, so it means that's a, that's a huge issue. Now, so I want you to think about this. Notice it says, think about this in verse 24. And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. Question, how do I crucify the flesh in my life? It says that we do or we can. So how do we do it? Remember, the question is always how. How do I do that? How do I do that? So it is possible then to live a life that's honoring and pleasing to God because I'm going to deal with my the affections and lusts. Got it? It's possible. Now, the sadness today is it's possible, and with, through the power of the Holy Spirit I can do that, but most Christians aren't focused in on submitting to the Holy Spirit. So if I walk in here tonight and I say, remember last night I asked you, if you, are you in fellowship with God? And if I walked in and I said, it's Adam, right? Amos, okay, got it, sorry. Bill's over here, this is Amos, all right. All right, Amos. I walk in tonight and I said, hi, Amos, how you doing? And we had a conversation to start. And I walk up, I said, Amos, are you in fellowship with God? And Amos is probably going to say yes, right? Because he thinks that he's here tonight. Or he's here on Sunday. Or he goes to, you know, soul winning. Or all of those different activity oriented things that we have. Now, should we be in the house of God? Yes. But the point being here is this. What is my motivation? What is my motivation? You say, well, I need to keep the commandments. I understand that. But I, I keep them, and I should keep them, because I am a spirit-controlled person. I'm not going to be able to keep them through the power of the flesh. Understand? And most people are serving the Lord in the power of the flesh, and they do not understand why that horrible things happen in their life or they're they're focused all the time on difficult things you know their life is just going out of control on different things they're fighting with their spouse their children have walked away from God they're unfocused there's all kinds of issues and they don't understand why be not deceived God's not mocked for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. So if you sow to the flesh, that's what verse 8 says, Galatians 6. If you sow to the flesh, you shall of the flesh reap corruption or destruction. So I need to understand for the betterment of my life, for the betterment of Mount Vernon Baptist Temple, for the betterment of our relationships together, the betterment for the relationship with my wife, the betterment for the relationship with my husband, the betterment for the relationship 
with me and my children. I need to be a spirit-controlled person. Amen? Yeah. And notice what it says here. Verse 24, And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and what, folks? Lust, plural. That should be our goal. Because look what verse, the next verse says. If we live in the Spirit, and the moment we get saved, the Holy Spirit comes to indwell us. Okay? And there's at least 70 different things He does in our life. But at that moment, He comes to indwell us, but we can grieve Him. We can hurt Him. That's what the word grieve means. It means hurt. Because we don't submit to Him. We don't see the need to submit to the Holy Spirit. We think now that we're saved, everything's okay. Sure, we're going to heaven. That's a big, that's a big deal, isn't it? Now, I also want to throw this out to you. And I had an article on this just recently. One of these days, I will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. To give an account of myself. You'll give an account of yourself. You know, the Bible says that there are people that will stand before Christ and they're going to suffer loss. And you know, I, I know that really, when I really grasped that years ago, that, hey, you know, everybody thinks we're going, you know, we go to heaven and it's all going to be hunky-dory. But when we stand before our Lord, the Bible says that there are those that are going to suffer loss. So the picture of what I get there, Bill, is that there's going to be some people that walk away from that, and it's not going to be a joyful moment. They shall suffer loss of reward and I'll take it a step farther obviously if I was not a person that was spirit controlled in this lifetime and didn't see the need to have that be done I'm not going to lead in the next one you understand so I need to understand that you know being a non spirit controlled person is going to affect me in eternity. Y'all with me? Yes? It's going to affect me. It's going to affect you in eternity. So I need to really understand then, it says here, if we walk in the Spirit, you know, if we live in the Spirit, unless it's the Holy Spirit's in us, then we need to what? Walk in the Spirit. Now, by the way, that's a command. That's not optional equipment. But you know what's the interesting thing, Bill? God has made us with a will. And we've got, we've got a message up on our YouTube channel called Everything in Life is a Choice. So I choose to be a spirit-controlled person or I choose not to. Now maybe I choose not to because I, I've never understood how to be a spirit But the, the Bible's clear on it. It's clear in this chapter, and he says it twice. Didn't he? Amen? Now look, I'll point it out again. Look at verse 16. You know, by the way, this is right after the biting and devouring. Okay? So if you bite and devour one another, take heed you not be consumed one of another. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, 
and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Period. So I have to focus on walking in the spirit, being a spirit-controlled person. And it's interesting, if you go over to Ephesians 5, you know, it talks about marriage there. And it tells us how to be spirit-controlled people. And that we are to be a spirit-controlled husband. That we're to be a spirit-controlled wife. And he's basically saying there that if you really want to have a marriage that's honoring and pleasing to God, there is no other option in the room. So, if mom and dad aren't spirit-controlled people, what do you think Junior's going to be? Right. And so he's going to go out here and all of those things that are involved in it, the Galatians 5 here. And mom and dad's going to say, what in the world happened here? Now just about every church we go to, somebody will walk up and say, you know, my, my daughter is living like the devil. And I don't understand. Because she grew up in this church and she went to our Christian school or she was homeschooled and I don't understand why she lives this way. I was in Michigan and there was a guy who was retired uh, from the Air Force. And he came in the morning service and he says, wow, he comes up to me and says, man, that was really good stuff. He said, I really enjoyed it. Praise the Lord, he said. I'm, he said, I got a 44-year-old daughter. She's living like the devil. He said, I'm going to go tell her this afternoon. She needs to come over here you tonight. I said, wonderful. We're glad to meet her. So he comes back. He walks in. He looked like he'd been sucking on a pickle. And he, he comes up to me and he says, I almost didn't come tonight. And I said, well, why, didn't, why would you not want to come tonight? Well, I went over and talked to my daughter. Okay, good. You, you invited her? Oh, yeah. She's not coming. I said, well, what happened? He said, I told her. You need to get your life right with God. You're living like the devil here. And, you know, you've been living with this man or that man or some other man. He said, you need to get your life right with God. And you need to get along with the church house tonight. I said, is, how did that work for you? <laughs> he says, well, she's not here. And I said, I understand. Listen, someplace along the line, he lost her heart. And every time he sees her, he's beating up on her. beating up on her, and I told him, I said, now I want you to listen to me real careful here. She turned you off a long time ago. She turned you off a long time ago. And you keep pounding her. I said, why don't you try this? You know, the Bible says, be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Why don't you try being kind? So said, don't, don't tell her she's living like the devil or that she's, <laughs> she acts like the devil. I said, don't tell her that. Maybe, you know, now in texting, I used to have, and, you know, I, I, was, I was actually a pastor before the Internet. That tells you how old I am. I know I don't look that old, you know what I mean? But I used to have cards on my desk, and I would, I would pray and ask God, who do you want me to encourage today? And I would send out a card. You know, I'd, I'd write out, you know, hey, Brother Joe, I've been thinking about you today. God laid you on my heart. Just wanted to know if you were having a good day, and I just wanted to let you know I'm praying for you today. 
So I, I want you to know that. I'm not sending it out to them. But I could call and do the same thing. I always ask God who he wanted me to encourage that day. I still do. Just did it today. But now I can text. You know, I've got other means of doing it now. So I said, why don't you send her a text and just, you know, tomorrow, not today, but tomorrow and say, whatever her name is, Melinda, I just want you to know I was thinking about you today. I love you, Dad. Now let, me, let, me, let me help you understand this. No matter what your daughter or your son is doing, you, can, you, know, you may not love what your child's doing, but you can still love your child. Now, it does mean you compromise with your child, but you can still love your child. And so just tell her you love her. You know, I love you. And let it go. And then, maybe next week, another text off, just thinking about you today, darling, I wanted to let you know I love you. I had one lady one time who says, Oh, you know, he says, when I, he said, you know, my, we took your advice, and uh, my daughter called, and she says, Mom, yeah. she says, what do you want to know? She wanted to know if they were okay, because she says, you know, they're not, they're not bashing on me anymore. Are you guys okay? Yeah. You know? And, and, and she specifically said, is Dad okay? He's not bashing on me. And she says, no, we're fine. We just want, want you to know we love you. So she sta they started to get back her heart. Get it? But just remember this. They probably lost her heart because they were not in fellowship with God. Get it? Now, that doesn't necessarily always mean that, okay? Because life is a choice, and everybody makes choices in life, and we're not responsible for other people's choices. Got to understand that. We're not responsible for other people's choices. They're, they're going to make their choices. But the reality here is, is that do you know that the Bible says that love is kind? So, last night, Kim was telling me that one of the pastor's children, I said, I said you know, and I married a lovely, a lovely girl. And he turned around and looked back at Kim. You know? And I did. You know, <laughs> and Kim says, "Yeah, he was probably thinking that old woman you said." You know. <laughs> yeah, what was that? You know, man, what happened there? No, you know. I just want I just want you all to know tonight that God loves you, and He wants to help you, but you've got to learn a very important word. It's called submission. You've got to be willing to submit to the Holy Spirit and let Him work in your life. Ask Him questions. Let Him show you. Now, I want to, I want to finish with uh, this. I will, I, you know, some people have asked me about question asking. I want you to notice this. Now, you know, I have, uh, <clears throat> I have dealt with uh, people who have had terrific loss in their life. And so one of the, I, I see many times people will forget being a spirit-controlled person when they get hurt. And so the question, Pastor, the question asking was a real blessing to me when I saw that tool because it came out of one of the greatest hurts in the Bible. 
So I'd like for you to turn back to 1 Samuel chapter 30, and then we're going to be done here. All right, well, I'm going to show you this, and then I'm going to show you one more thing. But I want you to look back to 1 Samuel chapter 30. I'm going to tell you the story here. And so David and his men are out fighting the enemy. And when they come back, another enemy had come and burned their homes, took their families, took their animals, and took all the goods that they had. So here is David and his men, and they come in, and their house has been burnt, and their wives are gone, and their children are gone. And the Bible talks here about this being an extremely difficult situation. But I want you to notice. Verse 4. Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. You ever met anybody that had no more power to weep in their life? I have. I have. I've had to try to help people who are in that position. And so, the, and notice it says down here, and verse 6, and David was what, folks? Didn't say he was distressed. It said he was greatly distressed. Because, and the reason why he was, it was because of his wife, his family, and for the people spake of stoning him. So they, you know, they were so upset that they were sizing up stones to stone David. And then the Bible says, because of the, the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. So in this moment of great tragedy, David had sense enough even though he was greatly distressed, the Bible here says, but he inquired of the Lord. Now watch. Wait a minute. Now, now watch this. Watch this carefully. Now watch what it says. In verse 8 it says, or verse 6 it says, I'm sorry, but David encouraged himself in the Lord. Okay? Now I want you to think about this. Dave, here's the guy who took down Goliath. Okay, when everybody else was scared to death of Goliath. David walked out and took down Goliath because he trusted God. So he can remember that God helped him in a very difficult situation. So he encouraged himself in the Lord. And now, look what happens here. And the Bible says in verse 8, this is what I want to get to. It says in verse 8, And David inquired at the Lord. He asked God a what, folks? A question. And David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he, God, answered him, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. Well, if it's good enough for David to ask questions, it's good enough for you and me to ask questions. So when something is really a struggle, really difficult, a very difficult thing, one of the tools that God has given us is to ask him what? Questions. Not to tell God how bad he is, but to ask him questions. And here he asks God, Shall I pursue after this group? God told him yes. He said, you go after them and you'll recover all. Now, Bill, how long do you think it took for those guys for whatever, get on whatever they were riding and took off? Quickly. They mounted whatever they had to ride and they took off and they rode hard and they rode so hard that some of the men got 
boy, they were wore out, and their animals were wore out. So they stopped and watered the animals, and some of the men and animals were so wore out that they couldn't continue, and David and some of the other men took off, and as to those guys rested a little bit, then they took off. And you know what happened? They recovered all. Nobody was hurt. They got back their goods. They got back their families. Nobody was hurt. Boy, talk about God turning around a situation here. When David said, I'm going to ask God about this. And so many times we'll go ahead and make decisions without ever asking God anything. And Matthew 7, 7 says, Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. And the Bible says that God knows what you have need of even before you ask. But ask. And who do we think we are telling the God of the universe in prayer what he's going to do? We better be asking. Now last night, I didn't finish up with this, but I'm, go I'm going to tonight. Now you remember I said whenever there's a point of impact in your life, you want to stop, you want to think, you want to submit, you want to turn it over to God, and what do you want me to praise you for and thank you for? And we saw that last night. That's, that is all over Scripture. Now, I want you to turn back to Hebrews chapter 13. I want you to look at verse 15. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 15. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 15. Now, I want you to watch this carefully, and we're going to be done, but this is extremely important. Look at verse 15 with me. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of what, folks? Praise of God when? Now, watch it. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. So this, the Bible says this is to be done when? Continually at the point of impact. So when something happens in your life, you immediately stop, think, turn it over to God. What do you want me to praise you for? I want to submit myself. What do you want me to praise you for? What do you want me to thank you for? And it's going to pop right into your mind so that you're not going to be defeated and depressed and discouraged and downtrodden and all that other stuff. One more thing, Pastor. All right. We've been using this with our counsel. It's a, it's a newer tool, okay? Turn back to John 14. When I say a newer tool, it's not a newer tool of the Bible but we've been using it more and more with our counselees. Now watch carefully here. Watch what this says. This is extremely powerful. And notice what it says. Now again, we're talking to you about having a real, intimate, personal, and passionate relationship with God that I can ask Him questions. But notice what this says in verse 26. And this is the Lord Jesus Christ speaking here. It says, but the Comforter. Now, did you notice that that's a capital C? That means the Holy Spirit. And one of his ministries is to comfort you. Hear me? But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatever I have said unto you. Now, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit. Okay? Now, remember last night I said that when you ask God the four questions, the fourth question is, Lord, I want you to teach me today. I want this, the Holy Spirit to teach me today and give me your message 
for me. So the Bible here says that the Holy Spirit will teach you. You just got to ask. Got it? You just got to ask him to teach you. And he'll teach you. So every day I'm telling my counselees you need to ask God to give you his message for you today and teach you. But now I want to show you this last part, and I'm going to go back up to the comforter. And notice what Jesus said here. Very powerful thing. Peace. Did you see that word? First word? Everybody got it? Peace. I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth you. Not as the world giveth. Give I unto you. Let your heart let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Wow. Do you notice that word let there about let not your heart be troubled? See that, Pastor? When you see let like that, it means somebody's got to make a decision. And it says let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Now we deal with a lot of people that are afraid. You know, something's happened in their life and they're afraid. So, I mark this in my Bible. This is the answer for you if you're afraid. So, I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit, of course, to teach me. But how about this? I'm afraid. I would like to have the comfort of the Holy Spirit now. And give me your peace, please. Got it? I would like to have the comfort of the Holy Spirit now. And give me your peace, please. He says, my peace I leave with you. So that the person... And you know what's happening? All of our counselees are saying this. Whenever I do that, it's like, you know, I'm having a difficult day or a situation, it's like calm immediately. Inside, the calmness is there now. I've had like four of them tell me in the last couple of weeks, boy, that is, that is a great tool, Pastor. I have used this now and it has really helped my life. I want the comfort of the Holy Spirit now. And I want your peace, please. Try it. He is the comforter. He wants to comfort you. But remember, you've got to submit. So ask. By the way, when you ask God a question, that is submission. When you ask him a question, that is submission. And so I encourage you to do so. Remember, praise and thanksgiving, you know, to be done continually at the point of impact. But when you're afraid, and there's going to be a moment in your life when you are afraid. So Satan's going to bombard you with different things. I would like the comfort of the Holy Spirit now, and I would like your peace, please. Will he give it? Yes, he will. And you'll see God. You'll see God in a way you've never seen him before. And let God do great and mighty things in your life, your home, your children. Let God do it by being a submitted person to the Holy Spirit and be a spirit-filled and spirit-controlled person. Let God work in your life. And you'll see a lot of things that you've never seen before. Peace. Do you know that last night I started off with Romans 15, 13, and it says that God wants you to have hope he wants you to have joy, and he wants you to have peace. 
so why not ask for it? Amen? Why not ask for it? And teach your children to do the same thing. Let them know that God can help them and let them know that they need to have a real, intimate, personal, passionate relationship with God through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen?